you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thanks a lot. Very happy to be here with my friends um, north of the border. My daughter lives here and has lived here for a long time. She went to UWM. Um, love Milwaukee and I'm um, very honored to be here um, to speak to so many of you new friends um, and plenty of old friends as well. So let's get started. Um, interstate rivalries, and I'm from Illinois and you're from Wisconsin, so you know where this is going. Interstate rivalries between Wisconsinites and their Midwestern neighbors. Um, those rivalries have been alive and well for a long time. And the great age of Civil War battlefield preservation at the turn of the 20th century is no exception. Um, take, for example, the words of one Wisconsin veteran who praised the State Monument Commission, that's working, um, for uh, for its work at Vicksburg, and he also used the same occasion when he was praising the State Monument Commission to um, get in a not so subtle dig at Wisconsin at Badger lawmakers whom he deemed a little too fiscally conservative, and you can read that as cheap. Um, his name was Private Hosea Rood from the 12th Wisconsin, and he was the one who compiled the report of the State Monument Commission on its work at Vicksburg. Uh, and in his remarks, he spotlighted uh, the debate about funding the monument uh, back in the day in order to level criticism at frugal, and those are his words, lawmakers, while also appealing to his audience's civic pride. And here's what um, Private Rood had to say. He said, while the bill providing for this memorial was pending in the legislature, some people said plainly that they weren't in favor of it. They didn't believe in spending so much money to put up a monument away off there where very few Wisconsin people ever would see it. But such, object, but such objections did not prevail. Now that we have our beautiful memorial at Vicksburg, and I have to admit that um, it's one of my personal favorites. Now that we have our beautiful monument at Vicksburg, it's doubtful if anybody regrets that it was erected. It would not be to the credit of our good state to have no memorial to our 9,075 soldiers in the siege of Vicksburg, while our neighboring states, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois, have dealt so generously with theirs. And it was exactly this loyalty to home and to community as well as to their country uh, that drove the work of groups of veterans as they remembered their experiences and as they worked with the federal government to mark the battlefields of our first Civil War parks. Uh, commemoration of the war, though, didn't start with the establishment of the first national military parks during the 1890s. Actually, um, that work to memorialize and preserve uh, had its origins in the war years themselves. Um, in several instances of active duty soldiers erecting monuments on sites of recent combat, like the Hazen's Brigade Monument, still very visible at Stones River in Tennessee. Um, also in the establishment of national battlefield cemeteries for Union dead by both public and private sector entities of the North. And finally, the work to preserve and to commemorate and to memorialize had its origins during the war in the precedent-setting efforts of private citizens to mark and protect land um, at Gettysburg as strictly a union shrine. Um, then, subsequently, um, over the decade and a half after Appomattox, commemorative activity uh, on the battlefields continued virtually without Southern participation, not too surprisingly, as the battlefields healed and changed. On the other hand, though, by 1880, Americans also had celebrated their shared revolutionary heritage uh, at the time of the centennial. Uh, maybe more importantly, by 1880, Reconstruction, um, with its military occupation of the South and federal enforcement of freedmen's rights. By 1880, um, Reconstruction had come to a close. So these were areas of national history and racial politics where Northerners and Southerners potentially could find some common ground. Uh, especially it was after Reconstruction, as veterans of both sides realized that they shared the experience of combat as they worked together in business and industry and politics. 
uh, it became possible for battlefields to remind a significant number of them um, of feelings other than grief and feelings other than hatred. And it also became possible um, for battlefields to serve needs other than remembering just the Union war effort alone. Uh, the 1880s also saw this, also saw this growing phenomenon, um, and these were so-called blue-gray reunions. This one at Gettysburg in 1888. These were celebrations of national unity in which veterans of each side publicly acknowledged the courage. They were veritable love fests, some of them. Um, they publicly recognized the courage and devotion to duty of their opponents, but without necessarily conceding away the cause for which um, their own side had fought. These meetings started as early as the mid-1870s. Um, they picked up momentum both off and especially on Civil War battlefields uh, during the 1880s. And then with the coming of the war's 25th anniversary during the mid to late 1880s, uh, battlefields gripped the attention of aging and politically active veterans, many of whom, or at least some of whom, were significantly members of Congress. Uh, and those old soldiers, in turn, then became key players uh, in the drive that brought about the initial preservation of Civil War fields at national, at federal expense, at taxpayers' expense during the 1890s. Um, established by Congress in August 1890, Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park is our first federal battlefield park. Uh, later that same month in August 1890, uh, a law that set aside um, funding for preserving battle lines and for buying land to mark true positions at Antietam, provided the legal basis, no caption needed, we all know that, um, provided the legal basis for what became called Antietam National Battlefield Site. Then rounding out the five granddaddies, if you will, uh, that make up the nucleus of our National Battlefield Park Network are Shiloh in 1894, uh, Gettysburg in 1895, and finally Vicksburg in 1899. Um, at a time when there was no National Park Service as we know it today, uh, and only a few other so-called national parks, like Yellowstone and Yosemite, for example, both of which were Western wilderness parks. Um, at that time, Civil War preserves that were established during the 1890s set the precedent. They really were the prototypes for all national historical parks of whatever name or whatever designation going forward, period. So those turn century military parks um, on Civil War battlefields are among, still today, the premier historic sites in the entire national park system. And that term military park, I think, deserves a, a little bit of consideration here, um, in part because it was a title that was meant to confer status, the term national military park, by the men of the war generation who coined it. And chief among them was this guy, Henry Van Ness Boynton, um, from my own state of Ohio. He was a veteran of the Army of the Cumberland. He was the godfather of the Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, and he was one of the originators of the military park idea, if you will. Uh, and exactly what do I mean by that? Boynton and his fellow park supporters imagined these preserved battlefields as lasting memorials that would honor the great armies of North and South in which they had fought. So in that sense, their motives were very personal. On the other hand, though, uh, a second purpose that was articulated by park advocates in their effort to get congressional approval, which they obviously had to have to get federal funding, was the potential usefulness of Civil War fields as outdoor classrooms, as classrooms for study by historians and especially by professional soldiers. This, this second rationale was a matter of political expediency. It was a justification that was used by backers as they sought unprecedented federal funding for battlefield preservation. So an emphasis on the basic <coughs> excuse me, utility or pragmatism of the military park idea became a key weapon for the individuals who pioneered battlefield preservation nationally. And from that time to the present, um, the government's historic battlefields have functioned as places for instructing all kinds of soldiers or all kinds of students, both civilian and military alike. Uh, additionally, besides the park's usefulness for teaching Americans about history and about waging war, among other things, there was another side to the practicality of calling these first Civil War parks military parks. 
Preservation advocates needed, obviously needed political support, and they needed enough support in Congress, and they needed it from both Northerners and Southerners to pass establishing legislation for battlefield parks. But open talk of things like slavery and race and secession and disloyalty and other such matters was capable of upsetting emotions that were still pretty close to the surface during the 1890s. If those topics entered the debate about battlefield preservation, needed consensus about preserving them um, could have been harmed significantly or destroyed completely. So what was the solution? Well, the solution was the following. Eliminate even the possibility of con controversy by avoiding potentially inflammatory subjects altogether and emphasizing instead something that um, everybody could agree about, something about, about which all Americans could agree. And that was the courage and the skill of American soldiers regardless of their allegiance, regardless of where they came from. So the name National Military Park, with emphasis on the military, was an invention of the founding generation that highlighted the fighting ability of our soldiers. At the same time, it also represented an idea that was capable of uniting Americans by steering clear of some of the Civil War's more problematic political and legal issues. Finally, as sites where future warriors would learn lessons about American military history, the new parks were placed, not too surprisingly, under the man management of the Department of War uh, in the 1890s. Um, this emphasis then on all things military influenced how the founders shaped this core collection of Civil War sites. So as they focused on soldiers' experiences in combat, and as they, um, and as they did all of that, um, as, and as they tried to maintain a field's wartime uh, ex a wartime appearance, which is very important to them. The men who worked on those sites rebuilt or reconstructed the, reconstructed the stories of great battles without necessarily uh, recalling the reasons for the conflict in the first place. So under the supervision of the War Department, commissions of veterans from states whose troops had fought in a specific contest, and this was mainly Union states, but a few Confederates um, initially in the early 20th century those state commissions determined the battle lines of their units, um, and then they marked those locations by erecting monuments at state expense. Besides the Wisconsin Monument at Vicksburg, I'll just um, say that this is probably my single most uh, meaningful monument, and maybe and all of you, I think, will, re will recognize it, or some of you will have been to Antietam. It's the wounded lion icon symbol um, of the 15th Massachusetts, which is right on the edge of right in, inside of the West Woods. It's quite beautiful. And this is how the 15th, was, 15th Massachusetts marked um, scene of, a scene of their combat at Antietam. The same time that this was going on, representatives of the War Department um, in the form of three-man commissions of Union and Confederate veterans. These guys marked battery locations with condemned ordnance, and they marked troop positions with cast iron historical tablets that chronicled the combat action, that you'll also recognize that. You might know that Antietam is one of my favorite places. I'm right here on Stephen D. Lee Ridge, where the current visitor center is at Antietam, and in, in view of the Dunker Church, the condemned ordinance, and the War Department tablets, with which I think some of us are pretty familiar. Um, guided by their desire to tell their story on the land itself, veterans at that time then created spaces for remembering and for education it also reflected still today, and still does reflect today, the heroic memory and vision of the Civil War that prevailed turn of the century um, mainstream America. Um, as the war generation, though, died and left the scene, um, their movement lost some of its focus, lost some of its vigor, and especially lost the political clout that it did have um, at the turn of the 20th century. During the first quarter of, the, that, of that century, from 1900 roughly to 1925, um, administrative problems inside the War Department, ever-present fiscal concerns, and American involvement in the First World War slowed the creation of new battlefield parks, um, with fairly small ones established at only two sites between 1900 and 1925. And notably, and interestingly, in both cases, the acreage involved was donated, given free of charge, to the federal government by a private sector group, which made a big difference. Those two new ones were Kennesaw Mountain National uh, Battlefield Site near Atlanta and Guilford Courthouse National Military Park in North Carolina, which was the first 
so-called National Military Park on a battlefield of the Revolutionary War. Um, then, though, you've got this redirecting of time and energy toward um, projects, domestic, pro domestic, social, and cultural projects at home after the First World War. Um, and you do then see the first big growth, or the first real growth, of the military park network um, in 30 years. So during the late 1920s, early 1930s, Civil War related parks of a variety of different names were established at Petersburg, at Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Stones River, Fort Donelson, Fort Pulaski um, in Georgia, Bryce's Crossroads, Tupelo, and Fort Stevens in Washington, D.C. And that's all, not all. Uh, parks linked to other historic American wars emerged at that time as well. And that includes Morristown, New Jersey, Moores Creek, North Carolina, Kings Mountain and Cowpen, South Carolina, all of the American Revolution, Fort McHenry, Maryland, the War of 1812, and even Fort Necessity, Pennsylvania of the French and Indian War. Um, it's worthy of note here too, and this is a bit different, as the Civil War generation died off, as those guys passed from the scene, it was grassroots groups and ambitious politicians who played more direct roles in the establishment of battlefield parks during the 20s and early 30s. So while the preservation crusade of the 1890s was driven by this powerful veterans lobby, uh, key support for the next surge of activity came in many cases from groups of battlefield neighbors, I would call these guys battlefield boosters, who promoted local interests like tourism and like economic growth as well as promoting patriotic values. Um, another common feature, and, it still, uh, and this still resonates today, the, the, the issues that come from it, another common feature of parks that were created during the 20s and early 30s was prevailing use of something called the Antietam Plan in shaping those battlefields. The plan was so named because it was the model for land purchase and development of that battlefield since it was established in August 1890. Uh, based on the principle of absolutely economical preservation, the Antietam Plan called for the government to buy narrow strips of land that corresponded to battle lines and troop positions, and it also gave visitors access with the placement of tablets and markers and monuments um, on that land to tell the battle story, as you can see there along Bloody Lane or the Sunken Road again at Antietam. Based on the belief that the area around Sharpsburg, Maryland would stay in farm usage and agricultural usage indefinitely, which would eliminate the need of government purchase of big tracts of land. What the Antietam method of limited land acquisition appeared to do, it appeared to be the best way to mark the battlefield, open it to viewers, save money, and preserve an important historic site, accomplishing all of these admirable goals at exactly the same time. By contrast, the other four parks that were set aside with Antietam in the 1890s featured big tracts of land. Why is that? That's due in large part to the organized, politically powerful, and veteran-led lobbies, veteran-led lobbies, that press for government ownership of big parcels of land at Chickamauga, at Gettysburg, at Shiloh, and to a lesser extent at Vicksburg. Um, but as the old soldiers passed from the scene and as their influence and power was no longer there to advocate for battlefield preservation on a big scale. It was the Antietam Plan, the Antietam Plan that featured the acquisition of kind of ribbons of land that embraced battle lines and provided access. That became the preferred way to save and develop historic military sites at the federal level. Um, and after the turn of the century, with very few exceptions, these two are two of those exceptions. Um, P. Ridge and Wilson's Creek at the time of the Civil War Centennial in 1956 and in 1960. After the turn of the 20th century, with very few exceptions, nationally preserved battlefields did follow the precedent of commemoration and minimal land acquisition that was followed in Antietam with issues that still resonate in 2022. Um, with the 1930s, then comes a watershed for battlefield preservation and for federal battlefields as executive orders issued in 1933 by President Roosevelt transferred those properties of the War Department to the National Park Service. And the National Park Service in 1933 was a fairly young agency of the Department of the Interior. Uh, established in 1916, 
as an arm of the interior that would manage the department's western wilderness parks and its few, the few historical properties that it did own at that time. By the early 30s, the National Park Service remained something of an underfunded stepchild within the larger bureaucracy of the Interior Department. On the other hand, though, two of the Park Service's early directors, and those were visionaries, um, Stephen Mather and Horace Albright, you see them there. Uh, these two long had insisted that with the Park Service's experience in administering parks and also in educating the popular, or the, uh, in popular education or public education, that the National Park Service, in fact, was the logical steward of the War Department's cultural properties like its historic military sites. Now, um, this is not to slam the United States Army of the 1930s. The United States Army of the 20s and 30s clearly was interested in its heritage, but the modern War Department of that period had concerns, had a lot of concerns more pressing than historic preservation. Uh, and the Department of War at that time didn't have the resources needed to man battlefield parks in order to educate visitors who were neither veterans nor professional soldiers. But as attrition claimed the war generation, as that generation died out, and as relatively affordable autos revolutionized travel during the 1920s, Americans who had very little, if any, personal attachment to the battlefields, um, nor first-hand knowledge of them increasingly saw battlefields as tourist destinations. So there was a real need here for some educational programming in battlefield parks. Additionally, pragmatists like Mather and Albright, these guys recognized that park service ownership of Civil War parks, all of which were in the densely populated East, that had the potential to raise the park service's profile and also to expand its political base and get it the money that it needed. So they asked, who better to introduce these sites to the visiting public than an agency that has been developing interpretive programs literally since its birth? That question then found a willing listener in the newly inaugurated FDR, with whom Horace Albright, who was then director of the National Park Service, had a chance to chat um, during a Sunday drive through, among other areas, the Civil War countryside of Northern Virginia. Um, in April 1933, besides visiting the Skyline Drive, Albright made sure that he took the president to First and Second Manassas in Northern Virginia. Um, and acting with the foreknowledge that interior officials and the Secretary of War himself were supportive, Albright broached the subject um, of the possible transfer of the War Department's cultural properties, its historic battlefields mainly, to the president. And he himself was predisposed to such a common sense, those are Roosevelt's words, to such a common sense kind of um, fix, if you will, or, or reform of the federal bureaucracy. So the president very quickly mandated the change and executive orders went out that summer of 1933 and they moved, those executive orders moved the War Department's Civil War battlefields and its Civil War cemeteries and related smaller properties to the National Park Service, again from the, par from the War Department to the Park Service in the summer of 1933. With the transfer then, the National Park Service, which already was known as the federal body that was responsible for America's western wilderness parks, the Park Service with that transfer then moved to a real leadership position in the entire National Historic Preservation Movement with the extension of its authority over about 50 historical properties in the eastern part of the United States, which is also obviously the more densely populated part of the United States, the East was. Um, then of greatest immediate uh, benefit to the expanded park system was the birth of the New Deal, not too surprisingly. Starting in 1933 through the end of the decade, programs like the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration offered significant support um, to the expanded national park system, but the Civilian Conservation Corps, with which we're all some familiar, the CCC, really was the main driver of the Park Service's Depression-era efforts. Now, all three of those agencies, the PWA, the WPA, and the CCC, um, all three of them improved infrastructure, built visitor accommodations in national battlefield parks, but again, over its lifespan of about nine years, from 33 to roughly 1940, the CCC especially was critical to the evolution of the Park Service's educational programming in its historical areas. 
um, besides the basic conservation and maintenance that they did in western wilderness parks and scenic parks, core workers in places like this, in battlefield areas like Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg and Shiloh and Saratoga, to name a few. What did they do? They did things like excavate artifacts, they restored historic structures, some of them even provided guide service, all of this under the supervision of historians employed by the National Park Service using CCC funding. Um, so the human and material resources provided by President Roosevelt's different alphabet agencies were real lifesavers as the Park Service's rapidly expanding history function assumed huge new responsibilities in historic site management and in historic site interpretation. Um, with American involvement in World War II, however, and not too surprisingly, the Park Service saw its New Deal funding and its New Deal manpower evaporate. Um, social and cultural programs at home then took a back seat, not too surprisingly, to the war effort. But then the persistence of low funding levels for operations, for visitor um, improvements in the immediate post-war period didn't do much of anything to really help um, or to uh, shore up the deferred maintenance of the war years. Uh, on the other hand, though, battlefields and other historical and scenic parks all over the United States faced increasing pressure, even though they, their budgets um, did not reflect that. Uh, these kinds of places uh, bore up under increasing pressure during the 1950s and early 60s as Americans with rising disposable incomes, greater mobility, uh, and more leisure time uh, looked for tourist destinations. Um, and timing is everything, however. Uh, and the demands of Americans' love affairs with their cars and drivers are voters as well, uh, plus the anticipation of two landmark anniversaries. Those factors came together to make politicians especially receptive in the 50s to an NPS proposed initiative called Mission 66. What was Mission 66? Mission 66 was a 10-year visitor-focused um, development-intensive campaign that was instituted in 1956 to rehab the national parks after the neglect of the war years and to get them ready for the 50th birthday of the national park system in 1966. Also, to get Civil War parks specifically ready for the Civil War centennial of 1961 to 1966. Um, after all was said and done, and Mission 66 came to a close in the mid-60s, Congress had authorized over a billion dollars in spending, and a lot of the physical and interpretive features that we take for granted today in Civil War parks were in place by the end of Mission 66. Um, these are features like strategically located visitor centers with their orientation films, and bookstores, and museum exhibits, places like Antietam, and Gettysburg and Petersburg, as well as hundreds of those distinctive wayside exhibits along automobile tour routes, with which we're all familiar. Many of these as well, like these at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania, these are the offspring of the Mission 66 program. They're still there today. On the other hand, however, um, the post-war period also saw the acceleration of a disturbing pre-existing trend. Um, and what's that all about? That's the fact that commercial and industrial and residential development marched steadily after the war, as it had been starting to do even during and before the war, into rural and essentially isolated battlefield locations. Um, during the late 40s, for example, Park Service personnel at Gettysburg and at Fort Donelson noted creeping development on privately held land next to park borders. This is land that was usually significant in its own right. This was a problem that threatened each site's integrity, its wholeness, if you will, um, in telling the battle story. Uh, on, uh, and those kinds of, and, and that kind of development on the borders of battlefield parks also clearly was an intrusion on the historic viewshed. When Congress established legal boundaries for battlefield parks, clearly they did not take in, these are arbitrarily set boundaries, they don't take in all the battle action. During the mid-50s then, the possibility of a housing development in the heart of the Antietam battlefield there um, on the Piper Farm demonstrated another concern facing modern managers of battlefield parks, um, especially these strip-type parks that were shaped using the so-called Antietam plan. And that issue, that problem, was the problem of so-called inholdings. What are inholdings? 
in holdings or tracts of private land inside of a park's legal boundary, but over which the Park Service has no control. In view of all these pressures, however, Congress's long time to reluctance to fund the acquisition of battlefield land directly continued. And as the Civil War lost its place in the sun with the end of Mission 66, with the end of the Civil War centennial, um, rising real estate prices plus tight federal purse strings did not bode well for the Park Service's ability to take a proactive approach to development threats that were cropping up everywhere. And that's still not all. There's another issue here. At the same time that Mission 66 and the centennial ended, history as the story of great men and events. Um, the long time a definition of which Civil War fields were a prime example, that definition of history was under review against the backdrop of the civil rights movement of the 50s and the 60s and on into the 70s. As the civil rights movement spotlighted minorities and other neglected actors in American history. And as unrest linked to the civil rights movement as well as Vietnam era anti-war protests played out in cities all over the United States, the fact that the largest number of cultural holdings in the national park system were battlefields, that fact generated questions about the issue of balance in the system and about the relevance of National Park Service sites to urban Americans. So areas associated with military history were de-emphasized through the late 60s and the 1970s, even as federal funding for land acquisition continued to dry up. The fiscally conservative 70s then saw the addition of just one Civil War park or Civil War battlefield to the National Park System. That was Monocacy in Maryland. Um, and that was added to the Park Service, interestingly, or Park System, interestingly, in 1976, the bicentennial year itself. Um, and against that relatively unfavorable backdrop of the 1970s, one of the most prominent fiascos, and some of you who have got long enough memories will remember this place, um, in terms of intrusive development encroaching on battlefields generally and on federal Civil War fields specifically, a case study, if you will, was the late and unlamented National Gettysburg Battlefield Tower, Inc. How many of you remember this thing? Yeah, I figured you well. Um, providing a solid example of one of the most pressing threats confronting modern preservationists, this observation tower for tourists opened in 1974 on private land at the foot of Cemetery Hill. At uh, a height of 300 feet, it dominated, clearly it dominated the surrounding landscape. Now, prior to construction, the Park Service, which always seems to be operating from a position of weakness, and it was then, actually negotiated with a developer, a man named Thomas Ottenstein, to try and moderate the tower's impact, but met with very little success. In the meantime, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, which was backed mainly by local preservationists and environmentalists, the Commonwealth fought the case at various levels in court and lost everywhere. In addition, grassroots opposition on a national level never materialized, and so the tower was built. It went up in 1974. Um, it lasted for 26 years, at least it's gone now, um, I, if I offend any of you who really liked it, um, sorry about that, but it did go down and it went down in the waning days of the Clinton administration in the summer of 2000. Apparently Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt really wanted to get rid of it on his watch, so get rid of it he did. It was um, demolished, uh, interestingly on July 3rd, 2000, which was the 134th anniversary of Pickett's Charge, or was it the 137th? Um, some of you, somebody, someone of you can do that math, but it was the anniversary of Pickett's Charge, and down went the tower. Um, interestingly, 10 years later, 10 years after the tower opened, um, another dispute involving the commercial development of significant land next to another major Civil War park started to evolve, but it had a very different outcome than the one at Gettysburg. What started in 1984 as a proposal by an East Coast developer named John, um, nicknamed Till Hazel, to build a shopping mall on 500 acres of historically sensitive land. It's the so-called Stewart's Hill Tract next to the border of Manassas National Battlefield Park in Northern Virginia. That proposal of Till Hazel's eventually drew nationwide attention as well as broad condemnation and it climaxed in late 1988, on November 11th, 1988, 34 years ago tomorrow, uh, with President Reagan signing a law that authorized federal taking of the so-called, the entire so-called 
Williams Center property and that property subsequent addition to the National Battlefield Park at Manassas. So the question then becomes, how was this success story possible? In the mid to late 80s, when only a decade before, opponents were unable to stop um, a similar commercial development on arguably the most important and well-known Civil War battlefield in the entire country. In part, it was a simple matter of timing. The Gettysburg episode happened during the early 70s, when broadly based, centennial-generated enthusiasm for Civil War history had dissipated. Also, you had vocal anti-Vietnam War protests gripping public attention. And you had the National Park Service with real budget constraints. And it was also focusing, the Park Service was at that time, focusing on developing types of parks other than those related to military history. But the story of battlefield preservation is one in which substantial popular sympathy, if not vigorous outright support, has upheld effective efforts at the federal level. So there's popular support for this thing. Uh, and even though government's fiscal conservatism continued into the 1980s, by the time that the Manassas affair began to um, gain traction and attract popular notice, renewal of interest in American history that started emerging with the bicentennial of the mid-70s was drawing strength by the time that you got to the mid to late 80s from the approaching 125th anniversary of the Civil War. Besides timing then, another essential ingredient here in the successful movement at Manassas was the emergence of a group of dynamic local activists that was able to mine the vein of rising grassroots interest in the Civil War as well as draw support from a variety of places, from national preservation groups, from influential journalists and other shapers of public opinion, and the support of key politicians, especially members of Congress. Additionally, as they orchestrated this masterful publicity campaign, the Manassas Crusaders also took advantage of the vocal American environmental movement, which was dedicated to conserving green space and our rural heritage, and so provided a natural constituency for advocates of battlefield preservation. They were a natural constituency then, they remain so today. Um, against the backdrop then of the war's 125th anniversary, the convergence of all of those elements created a favorable environment for the pursuit of a preservation agenda at one Northern Virginia battlefield. Ultimately, um, the public out concern into which the Manan Manassas movement tapped was enough to make a last ditch federal preservation measure politically feasible. However, at a cost and an eventual cost to American taxpayers of $134 million for the 542-acre William Center tract, this kind of adversarial, crisis-driven, last-ditch action at national expense wasn't going to happen again. We knew that. Uh, that's one lesson of what's been called the Third Battle of Manassas. A related lesson uh, of the controversy also was the importance of, of cooperation between government on the one hand and the private sector, private citizens on the other hand. It was also clear that effective preservation efforts had to be based on anticipating problems, looking for them in advance rather than reacting to them. Going forward, in other words, reliance on strategic planning, not knee-jerk reactions to done deals was going to be crucial. And even in the midst of the Manassas crisis, as well as its immediate aftermath. Promising developments along these lines in both the public and private sector heralded the emergence of where we are today, and that's the emergence of the modern battlefield preservation movement. Two key events in that process were, first of all, the 1987 birth of a national grassroots land trust devoted solely to Civil War battlefields, and that was the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites, in response to the desecration of yet another Northern Virginia battlefield near Manassas, and that's the Chantilly or Ox Hill battlefield in Fairfax County, Virginia. And second key event that heralds the um, emergence of the modern battlefield preservation movement, passage of the so-called Civil War Site Study Act of 1990. And what that law did was pave the way for the first comprehensive study, the first comprehensive assessment uh, since the 1920s. Um, of America's Civil War battlefields, their sites' historic, historical significance, and threats to their integrity. And if you're a battlefield um, visitor as I am, you have to love, I've got to go back to this, this photo of people whom I think all of us know well. I think most of them have gray hair now. Will Green, 
Bob Crick, Gary Gallagher, and our friend Dennis Fry. Um, they all are a little bit older now, um, still have done good work, and there they are at the very beginning, um, really, really getting this modern battlefield preservation movement off the ground. So as now, this Civil War Site Study Act that I just referenced was a direct response to the federal intervention at Manassas. Um, the act, or this law, authorized the formation of a national commission of historians and other experts to carry out that study and then to advise Congress on preserving and interpreting the sites. In addition to the legis this legislative action, the creation in 1991 of the American Battlefield Protection Program, or ABPP, within the National Park Service was Interior Secretary Manuel Lujan's way of providing the staff support that was needed by the above reference Civil War Sites Advisory Commission in order to finish its study, in order to carry out its study. Five years later then, in 1996, Congress officially authorized ABPP in law with reauthorizations following periodically from then until now. Um, and at the same time, Congress also in 1996 with this law um, authorized federal grants and other types of financial aid to the Park Service's existing and future preservation partners, like the American Battlefield Trust, for example, as well as a variety of other private sector entities. Um, at any rate, once the Commission actually issued its report in 1993, ABPP's long-term mission at that point became helping state and local governments and private groups like membership organizations and foundations to carry out projects aimed at preserving and interpreting battlefield land. Um, ABP, say that fast ten times, although ABPP today engages in a variety of different activities to fulfill its mandate, arguably the most well-known of those activities is its annual competitive grants program, which encourages investment in battlefield preservation by providing matching federal grants on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis to private sector entities like the Trust, like the Save Historic Antietam Foundation, um, like um, the Gettysburg Battlefield, like the Gettysburg Foundation, all of those, and also to public agencies on both the local and state and national levels. Um, what's more, back to Secretary Lujan, visionary Secretary Lujan also knew very well that big time federal funding for land acquisition wasn't forthcoming. So he also decided on the establishment of a private foundation to help fund the preservation of the vast battlefield acreage that was um, at greatest risk, with an eventual focus for him on 50 so-called priority one sites that were designated in the Civil War Sites Study uh, commission, Commission's assessment. So in mid-1991, we've got the creation of something called the Civil War Battlefield Foundation. It was announced at Lujan's behest, and it had an initial goal to be raised through corporate fundraising of $100 million by the year 2000. That goal soon was adjusted publicly to $200 million. Early in the following year then, Congress passed the Civil War Battlefield Commemorative Coin Act of 1992, which authorized the sale of commemorative $5, $1.50 pieces, and the monies raised like that through a surcharge on each coin, they were going to be used for preserving threatened battlefield land by the Civil War Battlefield Foundation, which was renamed the Civil War Trust in mid-1992. In the end, though, Neither funding from corporations nor from the sale of the commemorative coins materialized to the game-changing extent that folks had thought uh, it would be. And over time, the ABPP Matching Grants Program has become the mainstay of the current American Battlefield Trust efforts, as well as the efforts of other private sector groups and government bodies. Now, today's American Battlefield Trust is the offspring of a 1999 merger, and that's a merger between the Association for the Preservation of Civil War Sites that I referenced a few minutes ago and the original so-called Civil War Trust. The joining of those two organizations in 1999 became at base a practical matter as both of them moved through, moved through the 1990s um, precisely in order to deal uh, with constantly emerging battlefield uh, threats, development threats in battlefield locations virtually everywhere but especially in large, outside of large urban areas. 
And to do that in a timely and cost-effective and sophisticated way, it was imperative for the preservation community as represented by these two organizations to avoid the duplication of efforts, to steer clear of uh, appealing to the same donor, va donor base, and last but not least, to speak to Congress with one voice and with one clear uh, message. The merged organization was known at inception in 1999 as the Civil War Preservation Trust. It reverted back to Civil War Trust in January 2011, again for pragmatic reasons, and that was mainly brevity and simplicity in establishing its identity. Um, additionally, and this is more recent, um, as an organization that was experienced in working with the American Battlefield Protection Program and as an organization that was versed in fairly complicated real estate transactions and land stewardship, the trust launched an initiative called Campaign 1776 um, in, 20, in 2014, just eight years, um, just eight years ago tomorrow. Um, and this was in correct anticipation, um, the start of this campaign, um, of an expansion of the American Battlefield Protection Program to provide grants now for Revolutionary War battlefields and War of 1812 battlefields, whose historical significance and endangered status was determined by a more recent congressionally authorized study that was comparable to the original Civil War site study of 1993. Um, the trust remained focused on Civil War battlefields, but the Campaign 1776 project allowed the application of established funding methods and preservation procedures to benefit other historic American battlefields as well. Finally then, in May 2018, just four years ago, a little over four years ago, um, with Campaign 76, having preserved about 670 acres of Rev War and War of 1812 battlefields, places like Brandywine and Charleston and Maxwell's Field at Princeton, um, and with key stakeholders, trust members chief among them, voicing support for the idea in May 2018. Um, the trust board made expansion of its mission official by rebranding the then Civil War Trust as the American Battlefield Trust. Um, as it emerged from the Manassas crisis of the late 18, 1980s, the contemporary preservation movement um, has relied on the cooperative model. Clearly, none of us can get this job done alone. So with that as its mantra, um, national and regional and state and local membership groups work in partnership with each other, uh, and they collaborate with government bodies at various levels. This public-private cooperation matters at all, all levels, but it's really critical locally because it's at the local level that um, all kinds of important decisions are made, like zoning decisions, for example. Um, Interest and, uh, more importantly, um, even though developers have often, more often than not, been a thorn in the side of developers, uh, or in the, in the side of preservationists, sorry, an invaluable asset for the current preservationists and the current preservation American Battlefield Trust uh, can be a developer who has the will to help and the imagination to do so. Case in point is the Trust's first day at Chancellor, Chancellorsville project of 2002 to 2005, in which the Trust's invaluable partners actually were two developers, um, a sympathetic local company, which was called Tricord Development, and the Toll Brothers, which was a national builder of luxury homes um, that was willing to compromise with preservationists. Another key ingredient here, in addition to cooperative developers, was a strategically sound and masterful public relations campaign, you can see some of it there, that focused on so-called smart development and that generated political cover for local officials, local government officials who favored that smart development, which very clearly had a preservation component. And in the end, 144, 140 acres, critical to telling the story of Chancellorsville's first day. And these are acres along today's busy Route 3, also known as the Plank Road, it's the historic Orange Turnpike in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. That once threatened 140 acres by the year 2005 were saved with another 74 acres saved in 2006. Um, finally then, in addition to the collaborative model, uh, another basic tool for modern preservationists, one that's not new but it really receives um, kind of renewed emphasis of late, has been the fiscal argument. 
and that is precisely the protective battlefields are economic engines that benefit communities through heritage tourism. The best part about this one is that it's quite quantifiable and quite visible for politicians and for taxpayers and for voters. Um, so in the end, uh, to tell the story of Civil War battlefield preservation is to trace the ways in which we've commemorated the war, uh, the ways in which we've responded to its tough issues, and the ways that we've used the past to deal with the present. Over the years, battlefields have been a lot of things to a lot of different people. They've been places clearly for grieving, for remembering, uh, for contemplating, for learning, for arguing. They've been places for driving a local economy, places for recreating, uh, and more. One thing that never seems to change, though, is their ability to inspire our attention and our concern, or did they not bring us here together tonight? So thank you for your kind attention for that fairly long talk, and I really do appreciate your kind attention. Thanks for being here. Is that that? Thanks. And I will take, thank you Any so questions? much. Sure. Absolutely. Do we have some questions out there? Okay. Yeah. Over here yes, over sir. Well, well, it did take, um, I think I alluded to that early on, in the immediate aftermath of the war, when the first parks were going up, the South was defeated, there was really no desire in the South to commemorate um, much of anything on the fields where the war had been lost, and what you had happening were markers and monuments going up in town squares and in lo localities where, in, in the South. Um, and as far as burials, and I'll just go a little afield there, as far as burials are concerned, these national cemeteries that I referenced, those were only for Union dead, although a few Confederate dead did, did creep into places like Gettysburg. Um, the, the first real um, interest in commemorating the war on, on national parks and national military parks came during the centennial. Uh, for example, that's when you see um, monuments from Texas and I think from Georgia go up um, at Antietam, places like that. Uh, you do not ever see, though, the, the interest and, and the push to do that that you did uh, in, the, in the North. So it took a while for Southerners to be willing to fund battlefields, uh, on, far, on far away battlefields where their sons had fought. So it, it, it took until the centennial to do that. So I hope hopefully that answered your question. That's when you really see it, but you don't, um, even today, you, if you go to places, especially Gettysburg, but the original parks like Antietam, and Shiloh, um, Vicksburg, you'll see a lot of Union monuments, but you don't see nearly as many Confederate monuments, and it's for, for, that, for that very reason. And the one and the Confederate monuments that you'll see are more recent ones, um, certainly probably from the 60s and then moving on to the present day. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Is there slowly running out of demand for reserving the spots for various monuments? In other words, uh, <coughs> what are we going to do? You mean save land or establish monuments? Target. Oh, you mean save land or build yeah, monuments? Or whatever. Well, so Oh, well, well there, I think there's probably a couple of questions there. I mean, get the process of being commemorated itself. They were putting up monuments. And it's, it's the, arguably the most monumented battlefield, um, and some would argue to the detriment of, act, you know, of actually just being able to go there and to, to try to, to, um, to think and to go back in time. But, um, these days, the Park Service does have a moratorium on establishing monuments on its battlefields. Every once in a while, if some political personality wants one bad enough, Teddy Kennedy wanted one at Antietam to the Irish Brigade, so he got one in 1990 when there was a moratorium. So you cannot put up any more monuments um, on, on federal land on battlefields, but on inholdings on private land you can.
As far as the land itself, I would argue that that's going to continue indefinitely. There will always be land to save. It's just that these days, um, there's still development. There's still commercial development. There's still some residential development or industrial development. But what we're seeing now are things like solar farms and big box and what else are those called? Um, solar farms and places like Amazon distribution centers um, that, especially in the D.C. area, outside of Washington, outside of Richmond, um, the demand for big plots of land to put those things up does go on. And at Brandy Station, I think right now, or recently, there was um, a, a concern about um, a, solar, a solar farm going up. So those are kind of the modern day um, expressions of the need to preserve, whereas before you probably had more industrial development or residential development that I was referencing in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So, I mean, I'm a preservationist, and I would argue that there's, there's always land to be saved. Um, and I, probably members of SHAF or, or the American Battlefield Trust would argue that there's land there to save. We thought for a while, well, the land will run, will run out of it, but not really. Um, as far as the Rev War is concerned, uh, because that war is so much further in the past, much of that is built over, and there's, it's a lot there's not nearly as much land to save, but revolution, but Civil War land, um, I'd argue that there, there's still some and, and there's still valuable land that we can save. And there's those inholdings, like at places like Antietam, private property inside of battlefield parks that you hope you'll find a willing seller um, who is willing to part with something that might be pretty important. But hopefully that, that's sort of more my philosophy than anything else, but hopefully that at least in part answered your question. Thank you. Yes, sir? That's a, that's a good question. Um, each park, I mean, there's an interior budget, and then each park has a budget, uh, and the superintendents, um, I'm, I'm not sure what that formula is, but that's all federal budgeting. And um, I think, it, as far to the best of my knowledge, um, parks, uh, um, pardon me for a little bit of philosophizing here, but congressmen love um, projects that they can take back to their constituents and they like to establish parks in their legislative districts. But along with establishing parks, you have to have the money to, to maintain them and to keep them up in perpetuity. And that's a little bit harder to get. Um, but that's part of the federal budgeting process. Um, uh, land, um, l much of the land for purchasing um, uh, doing battlefield land or for buying battlefield land comes from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is um, a federal fund that has something to do with monies from offshore oil leases. And I, um, to the best of my knowledge, that's what's used to um, help um, purchase, to, uh, to help um, take care of our parks. Um, but, but again, this has to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis, and it's part of the entire federal budgeting process. Anything else? Yes, sir. The, the, um, that was, there's, there's been enough battles of Manassas that I think we're probably on the 10th or 11th battle of Manassas because somebody always wants to put something up, because obviously because it's outside of DC. The one that I most remember was um, I think in the early 1990s. Um, and that was some developer wanted to put up like a, a, hit, a kind of a Disney, Disneyland only. It would be a history land. And you'd be taking, I don't know, taking a, um, a roller coaster ride through the, the Second Battle of Manassas. I mean, think about it. That kind of, I mean, I, I do have a good sense of humor, but I find that kind of appalling, you know. I mean, so they, talk, they talked about a Disneyfied version of history. And you really did see, I remember Jim, James McPherson, whom most of us have read, uh, kind of the dean of Civil War historians and, and other historians and public figures speaking out about this. And um, this guy, uh, whoever the developer was, apparently had not been paying attention with the brouhaha at Manassas in the 80s that resulted in the Civil War Site Study Act and all this other stuff. But that, that did not happen. <laughs>
Um, but these days, you still see local government officials um, who want, they want jobs in their communities, and that's understandable. And they don't mind bringing development. They want um, they, they, solar panel farms or, or um, distribution centers for Amazon. I mean, those provide jobs in communities, and they boost the economy. But they also bring uh, the need for infrastructure, increased traffic, and all of that. So um, place, groups like the Trust have been pretty effective in terms of PR and publicity. Um, in, in, in you know, getting the right kind of attention um, to, uh, to kind of allay those things. But you don't prevent all of them, nor can you. And you can't be totally anti-development because obviously we need that. But I think, as I mentioned, it's smart development and trying to find a balance, right? Uh, thanks for asking that question. Yes, I'm not in favor of Disneyfied history. I think it's interesting enough and it can be enjoyable enough and fun enough, yeah, without roller coasters and merry you know, and merry-go-rounds, right? Obviously, hopefully, you agree, I think you agree with me. Yeah, you're smiling. That's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Besides, I go to Six Flags if I needed to be entertained, and, and, I, don't, and I don't have to go to the East Coast to do it. So thank, thanks again for your kind attention. I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Well, Mayor, thank you, and present you with order the general staff of the Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee. This award is presented to Mary Abro for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War, the watershed event in our nation's history. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. Thank you. I'm going to put this down here. Thanks, guys. Got it. Put this in. I don't want to walk off with your clicker. So this concludes our meeting and I want to remind you that our next meeting is